Any attempt to predict Australia in 2020 necessarily includes a look back 30 years. Back to the sensational 60s when the mining boom flooded this country with capital and our standard of living was unparalleled. Our failure to reinvest that enormous wealth in local industry and the ensuing slide in living standards may cause our grandchildren to look back with more than a tinge of anger. It's not going to be very complimentary. I think that we will probably go down as the dopiest, laziest, indolent, most short-sighted generation probably in history uh, of Australia um, to fall from number one to number 27 in the world uh, must mark us as, as, as almost total idiots. Um, short-sighted, greedy, um, and uh, perhaps only starting to come awake in the late 80s, early 90s. We were once a country that depended heavily on selling our natural resources and the products of agriculture overseas. Australians lived off the sheep's back with an attitude that a strong back and a thick head would see you through. An attitude captured in the old saying, she'll be right, mate. But she's not right. In fact, she's a long way from it. If we continue the way we're going at the moment, we're heading for a disaster. Generally, the standard of living will go down to where you'll be eating bread and jam again. Or dripping. That's what we're going back to. We've allowed important Australian developed technology to slip through our fingers. And following it is the finest natural resource we have. About a year ago, I recall at the University of New South Wales where I teach, uh, at a graduation, five of the PhD students in chemistry were, weren't even around in Australia long enough to pick up their degrees. Each one of those students had cost the Australian taxpayer about half a million dollars in terms of their training. We had lost them to overseas companies, to overseas research institutes, because we couldn't offer them jobs. We still rely on agriculture. Our annual grain exports total $1.8 billion. But scientific and medical technologies provide a tidy billion dollars of exports themselves. We need to revalue the intellectual resources of Australia to fully utilise their worth. That's what a first world economy is all about. Brain power into wealth, not dig it up and ship it out. That's a third world economy. For too long, the focus seems to have been on failure. We hear lots about flamboyant multi-millionaires shifting deck chairs on financial titanics. But we hear little about companies that are world leaders, cornering 90% of a market with products they develop themselves. Companies like Nucleus, which with a vision of the future and a bionic ear implant, has done exactly that. Most of us don't think ahead very far ahead and think about, well, what kind of Australia would I really like to have? We, we are great muddlers in Australia. Many other countries are much more prepared to go out, out there, look down the track, determine where they think they'd like to go, and then set about going there. Then in coming months, our international credit standing will be downgraded. The challenge to our time. leaders has never been so awesome. <laughs> As their electors, we have the right to express disgust for visions that become decidedly blurry beyond the expected date of the next election. Some would go even further than that. There's nothing wrong with the Westminster system, but it's served its purpose. It's been around for a couple of hundred years. It now needs revising. There are Australians in this country that can do and would be able to put this country back onto its feet. But he must have the power to do so, and he mustn't be recruited by way of an electoral system. He must be selected, as you would any chief executive, and pay him commensurate with that. And when I'm talking about pay in today's dollars, his salary and perks would be not less than two to two and a half million dollars a year. Don't worry, I'm not forgetting you, darling. I'm he not may not be the correct reference to our future leader. I think the chances of a woman becoming Prime Minister in this country are better than they've ever been. 
I must say I don't have a particular individual in mind. I don't know uh, the federal political scene well enough to say that, but I think that the population is ready. So this will include... It's another case of underestimating the value of a human resource. In a country where there is only questionable support for children, families and working mothers, there are still formidable barriers between women and the workforce. One of the opportunities I think that really is beginning to emerge now is for women to participate in science, in technology and the world of business to a greater extent. So I think you'll see some of those stereotypes are breaking down and women grasping it with both hands because there's no reason at all why some of our top mathematicians, or many of them, shouldn't be women. Some of the people at the cutting edge of technology shouldn't be women. But the most disadvantaged people in Australia are Aborigines. Two centuries of treatment as second-class citizens is embedded in their psyche. They're not able to uh, take steps to improve their position because they feel hopeless. So the resurgence of Aboriginality, if you like, I think is a really positive sign. On Bathurst Island, off Darwin, that resurgence has been most evident in the arts. Last year, the Tiwi People's Art Council posted a turnover in excess of half a million dollars. But it's not as simple for those living in cities, where many of these works are sold. They're overrepresented in unemployment and imprisonment rates, and their health problems are chronic. If we find Aboriginal people in that position by the turn of the century and beyond as a community, we stand condemned. So I think it's important that governments are very interventionist, but that they do that in a way that clearly allows the Aboriginal people to take the running, to decide how, what and when. The long-awaited treaty between black and white Australia could be part of the answer. A treaty is going to definitely happen, uh, and Aboriginal people have to make that happen. The treaty is going to give uh, Aboriginal people uh, pride, and pride itself will carry Aboriginal people's future. The whole country's future depends on how we care for the land. We may be able to learn from those who are here before us. This might sound very radical to Australians now, but unless we take a leaf out of the book of the, our Aboriginal people and identify with the land and become sort of stewards of it, and, 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 and feel part of it. Their religion was the land. And that's what I'm saying. We can't have an economic religion that, uh, and survive that's divorced from the very land that feeds us and uh, b helps build our houses. Coming up, Super Sheep will be shearing them several times a year by 2020.